This is a hybrid paper by Stephanie Biller from the Université Paris-Cité, who warmly thanks the organizer of this workshop, and especially Ria Berg, and apologizes for not having come to Rome, which is definitely a locus amorinus, where it is fantastic to talk about Loca Horrida. The paper, Killa Creepers, the uncanny nature in Dionysiac Roman images, focuses on one of the ways in which the Romans thought about their relationship with nature through myths and images. Myth is, in, is indeed a material that allows to experience through the imagination the limits of human action in its environment. In each context, which varies according to chronological, geographical, and political criteria, the boundaries of this negotiated cohabitation evolve, as evidenced by the forms of the myths themselves. I will therefore focus on the way in which the romance of the, uh, the empire, especially 1st and 2nd century AD, put certain Dionysiac myths into images, considering iconography as a discourse in the full sense of the term. My aim is to show that Dionysiac imaginative world is based on the ambiguity of the status of nature, which blurs the boundaries between two categories, probably more ethic than emic, that of wild nature and domesticated nature. Then imagine. You are invited to a banquet by a rich owner of a huge domus in Vienna, in Gallia Narbonensis, at the end of the second century AD. You, you take place on the sigma shaped stibadium, a rounded uh, banqueting bed that borders the walls of the apes and you can enjoy the mosaic that decorates the entire floor. The first thing you see at a surface totally covered with plant motifs. Wine scrolls, volutes, curling stems, leaves and bunches of grapes, rendered by grit, with grit delicacy by gold, yellow, brown and black tesserae on a green, uh, dark green background. Sometimes a bird appears discreetly, hidden by, uh, in a scroll. As there are no boundaries in this decoration, as is usually the case in mosaics, notably between the central carpet and the apes, you are literally surrounded by this profusion of vegetation. The effect is, at first, extremely pleasant. You find yourself in a locus amorinus, an arrangement that plays on the thriving illusion of freshness, as in uh, Livia's villa at Prima Porta, or in some Pompeian gardens that had pergolas full of wines and ivy above the outdoor triclinium, just like the one standing in front of the Dionysiac century at Santa Bondi. But if you take the time to look more closely at the detail of the mosaic, you will discover that it is inhabited by characters. First, along the stibadium, there are Dionysiac figures who are participating in the banquet, just like you. Although part of the mosaic is missing, Members of the Dionysiac Thiazos are clearly visible. On the left, a pan bearded with his goat's legs and pointed ears, dressed in a panther's skin, the Pardalis, holds a pedum in his left hand and in his right hand a drinking horn, a rhythm, which he stretches out towards the center of the room and touches the wine scroll that joins it. Behind him, a munet is half-coated, dressed in a reddish-brown robe and reclining on a yellow veil. She extends her right arm, like pan, toward the center of the room. 
the central couple is too damaged to be properly identified. On the right hand, uh, we recognize a male figure dressed in a tunic, a red cloth, cloak and a crown, playing the lyre, lying next to a last figure, perhaps Bacchus himself, dressed in an overcoat, his long hair crowned with flowers, drinking from a cantarus that he is holding at face level. Unlike the other figures, he does not look at the center of the room, but a wine wraps itself around his left arm, which thus seems to extend into the vegetal decor. The actual spectators who participate in the banquet in the midst of these mythical creatures, who consent to get drunk according to the rules of the convivium, thus follow their figurative models by turning their attention towards the center of the carpet, where a last character is represented, isolated, facing them, struggling in the middle of the vegetation. Birded, muscular, naked, except for a blue clamis which floats around his torso and the boots on his feet, the ambades, armed with a, a double-headed axe. His identification is not difficult. It is Lycurgus, the king of Thrace, who opposed the arrival of the god when he was still a child and his companions. If the punishment of the impious king already appears in Homer, its modalities vary and uh, enrich with time. In particular, it's not until the Hellenistic period that Lycurgus is described as attacking the wine with his axe to get rid of Dionysus and his culture. And the first iconographic evidence of the metamorphosis of the Hyade Ambrosia goes back no further than the end of the 2nd century BC with this mosaic from Delos. Threatened to be killed by Lycurgus, she transforms into a vine just in time to escape from him and turn against him in his vegetal form, in her vegetal form, tying him up until the return of the god. It is from the Augustan time period th that the two parallel themes of Ambrosia threatened by the Kyrgyz and the wine strangling the Thracian king become widespread, both in poetry, Latin and Greek, and in figurative representations. To get an idea of this corpus, I refer to the old but very complete paper by Claude Vatin and Jean-Louis Bruno, Lycurg et Ambroisie, sur une nouvelle mosaïque de Delos. If the various versions converge on the whole, the vegetable attack remains little developed in the text. One can quote, for example, the verse of Statius in the Thebaid, which suge suggests the threatening approach of the wine, which crawls like a snake toward Lycurgus. Pampineumque iubes nemus in reptare lycurgo. The most violent version appears in late antiquity that attest to the longevity of the motifs and its revival in the 4th century AD, as witnessed by the Dionysiaca of Nonus of Panopolis, which devotes a long passage to the episode where the clusters are as dangerous as the fiercest used as a real weapon. A few verses further on, she insists on the contrast between the delicacy of her new vegetable condition and the deadly power she has kept. I quote, even uh, as one of the world of plants, I will wound you. I have no brazen chain but I will shock you with inextricable leaves. I will attack you, also a vine, that people may say Basarids kill mur murderers, even when they are part of the world of leaves. 
you have to fear even the jet of the warriors, for wines can shoot their enemies and grapes can stab them. An iconographic echo quite close can be found in the famous cup of Lycurgus made of dichroic glass now in the British Museum in London. As in the Dionysiaca, it is the violence of the god and his fiasos that are highlighted. Ambrosia on the ground has regained the upper hand of Lycurgus, the four limbs, the trunk and the neck entirely entwined by the wine, which makes him tremble. But if we turn back to the mosaic of Vienna, the effect is quite different. The punishment of Lycurgus is central in the composition, but the key of the decor remains the fantastic proliferation of this abundant wine, both decor and spectacle for guests. Ambrosia is not depicted unless she was represented in a deteriorated part. The god and his theasers are quietly installed at the banquet and observe almost passively the strength of the wine, defending, uh, by, uh, the, defending them by itself. Amoenitas remains predominant even if the threat of madness and death is part of its advent. This is an old idea in a very different context uh, uh, the archaic Athens, but still in a symposiac background, one thinks of the cup of Ezekias, where the god, lying alone in a boat, holds placidly a written with two windstock pushed along the mast of the ship. No sign of violence is suggested unless you are fami familiar with the myth of the Tyrrhenian pirates who can be recognized met metamorphosed into dolphins all around the hull. Just as on the, uh, the mosaic of Vienna, the climbing vegetation manifests the power of the god, which we know by the myth, the destructive force for those who oppose his power. But what is the added value to this motif much more developed in the iconography than in the text, except in the late Dionysiaca by Nanus. The answer is quite obvious. On the, white, on the one hand, if we consider the artistic criteria, the decorative potential, the covering power of this type of climbing plants fits perfectly with the taste that develops under the empire from the scrolls of the Arapakis to the flower, flowery style that invades the mosaics in the 2nd century AD. On the other hand, if we take the allegorical point of view, like philosophers that Diodorus Seculus calls physiologists, the rapid invasive growth of climbing plants, such as the wine and ivy, is irrepressible in the image of Dionysus. This biological characteristic could be explained as the manifest proof of a divine power. In short, content and form come together in a way that is quite original in Vienna and thus achieve two objectives. On the one hand, the mosaic expresses in image the power of Dionysiac vegetation, which contains a dangerous and controllable potential, in spite of the domesticated character of the wine. Indeed, in the Roman world, the wine was essentially cultivated by man, even if the ancient technique was to climb the grape stocks on high styles as can be seen on several mosaics from around the empire, that confirms the uh, archaeobotanical botanical research since the, since the works of Wilhelm Nagyszynski. Although under control, pruned, directed, oriented, 
the wine seems to keep a force of his of its own of development that the myth of Lycurgus amplifies, with a traditional religious connotation that warns not to have the hubris to oppose the gods. This myth is the history of the consent to the controlled race for humans. On the other hand, indeed, the mosaic of Vienna is designed to integrate the spectator on the bright side of the Dionysian power, that is to say into the banquet. We have seen how the visual dispositive creates the illusion that the human guests participate in the same banquet as the god and his theasos, taking advantage of the spectacle of a charming, abundant nature, which includes embraces the death of Lycurgus to recall the necessary consent to the constraining force of the nature. In the same way, most of the Roman images play on the ambiguous character of the vegetal nature, blurring the boundaries between wildness and domestic sphere beyond nature and culture, as the anthropologist Philip Descola would say. And Dionysiac realm emphasized particularly well these ambiguous areas, these rooms for negotiation between nature and culture, just as it questioned the taxonomic limits between the orders, the vegetal animal orders on the one hand, the human and the divine on the other. This idea well known can be illustrated with the opposite phenomenon that the one displayed on the mosaic of Vienna. Instead of representing the wild potential, potential of the domesticated nature, the one yard cultivated by the humans who know the rules of the banquet, the Dionysiac imagery likes to depict the wild nature domesticated by the charm of the god. I will take just two examples to highlight this idea. The first one exemplifies the domesticating power of Bacchus and powerful and dangerous wild nature embodied by a, the, a huge lion represented in the center of this mosaic, mosaic panel found in Antium from the middle of the first century BC, which follows an older pattern that, takes, that dates back to at least the second century BC with a beautiful copy of the series on a mosaic from the Samnit Pompeii. On a rocky background framed by a Dionysic century in the background, consisting of a temple um, on the left and a tree enclosed by a wall on the right, according to the codes for representing a rustic shrine, the statue of the god stands above three erotes playing music in front of the lion chained by a thin rope that encircles all four legs, the neck and the abdomen. This obviously signifies the power of the god associated with that of Aphrodite through the figure of the Erotus, over the brute force of nature and the beasts. I do not develop the abundant imagery of the Menads who plays with tamed panthers and snakes in the same way. The second example that illustrates how the Dionysiac world transforms a locus horridus into a locus amoenus is a pinax with shutters painted on the wall of a house in Herculaneum, now in the Archaeological Museum in Naples. The landscape is marked by the entrance to a cave in front of which trees grow in a rocky terrain. But this place of worship is conditioned by the installation of a ritual setup, which consists in, uh, of the installation of several statuettes on bases, including one of Priapus, but also a column that emerges behind the rocks and a veil stretched over the characters who came to perform the rites. It is a satire with brown skin and pointed ears, kneeling before an altar and holding a pedum, with reaching out to a minad with her naked upper body, 
who is turning towards him. The Dionysic nature of the couple is confirmed by the presence of a Thyrsus and a torch placed along the pedestals. The peace that emanates from this uh, wilderness under ritual control is essentially crossed by attention. The nudity of the characters, and especially the backside of the maenad, uh, which must certainly have been a sexually exciting detail for some viewers of these penates. As on the mosaics with the tamed lion, Aphrodite or Priapus or Pan are never far from these wide landscapes in which the Dionysian characters reveal the mix of their nature in between nature and culture. Finally, I would like to insist on a point that characterizes these Dionysiac images. Of course, these images all come from domestic spaces, domus and villas, sometimes, sometimes from tombs, but they are never placed in a real wide space. It's the vision of the painter and commissioners who imagine this loca horrida, turning them into loca amoena, with this added value which consists in keeping a touch of ominous character. But at the intersection between the mosaic of Vienna, where the domesticated one yard keeps a dangerous potential, and the Dionysiac landscapes, where the members of the Thiasos bring a civilizing aspect uh, to the wildness by means of uh, the ritual, there is another genre that, like the banquet scenes, plays on the fluidity between reality and representation. I am referring to the garden decoration, both the statue placed in the actual gardens and the painting representing gardens in other rooms of the Roman houses. The complexity of Astopiaria is well known. The plantations are very controlled, but the imaginative world they are referring to easily topples over into the idea of wild places. Just think of Atticus and Cicero at Amaltheia, who intended to create a place in their villa in the Strozzi and in Athenum that evokes the cave of the she goat Amaltheia. The numerous statues of Satyrs and Minads and Bacchus himself, as well as wild animals found in the gardens of Roman houses, like in the villa of the Papyri in Herculaneum, easily suggest that it was common to pretend that what nature had invited itself into the heart of the house. In this idea, I would like to end with this fresco from the House of the Golden Bra Bracelet in Pompeii, featuring a painted plant wall that certainly echoed the actual garden of the house. In the middle of the leaves, fruits and flowers that cover the entire surface of the panel, objects were suspended, like Cosilla, of which many archaeological examples have been found. Thus we see a pan flute, a metal cantarus suspended from branches by a red ribbon and a mask of Selenus. A mask, are you sure? This head, well animated, is not suspended by a ribbon. In the illusionistic game of the image, it is a real Silenus, hidden by the foliage, which invites himself in this marvelous garden and endowed undoubtedly and can also see. Thank you for your attention.